So as we move into lesson number six, I don't know about you, but I've been astounded again just who God is as he revealed himself through creation and just began to reveal himself. So at this point, there's light, there's atmosphere, there's earth, there's vegetation, there's food, uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and all the animals. So creation is complete, right? No, what's missing? Mankind is missing, isn't it? Absolutely. So you're right. God has completely set the stage for the climax of his creation, mankind. Everything that mankind would need to survive has been created, right? Everything that mankind was needed has been created to survive. God's desire is to bless. God's heart is one of blessing. And not just dribbles and drabbles. It's this boundlessness to pour it out in all of and everything. Like think of all of the, of the millions of colors that he made it. And then he gave us the ability to appreciate it. Think of all of the different tastes that, that he created in all of creation. And then he gave us the ability to savor it and to enjoy it. Think of all of the different sounds that he created, and then he gave us the ability to be able to appreciate it. A a group of mothers may be in a room, and their children are sleeping in the next room. If their child cries amongst all of the five or ten children, that mother instantly knows it's her child. How is that? And then think of all of the textures, and then God gave us the ability to be able to feel it and sense it. A blind man being able to read and sense even in, in, in the textures and everything. God just went above and beyond. His heart is one of blessing. The earth is now prepared to receive God's most amazing creation. God is just absolutely amazing in all that he, on all that he prepared. So let me illustrate. So what God wants to do is to overwhelm us with just how much he loves us in in all of his creation. So let me illustrate this for for us. So often when a couple plans to have their first child, they pour, pour everything into that moment by preparing the whole house, don't they? They pour all of their energy, all of their resources, all of their creativity in preparing for that moment of the child's arrival. But until the child arrives, the house isn't complete. The home isn't complete, as it were. And so at this point of the creation account, God created the world for mankind to live in, but at this point, the world was empty as there was no one created to live in it. So what length did God go to prepare your world, your home? Everything. Like think of, think of, think of like um, who he is, his power. How much of his power did he pour into it? Yeah, How how much of his knowledge did he pour into it? Yeah, all of it. Like, think, think of it, his holiness and his, his, like his ruler and his creator. How much of that rulership played into the creation, for preparation of our world? How much did he leave to the angels to prepare for us? Nothing. He took it, on, took it upon himself to prepare that for us, the demonstration of his, of his love for us. And all of that demonstration, God wanted to get through to us of his love and, the, and, the, and, and what, he, what he thinks of it. He did it for, he did it for each of us. He, he did it in light of who we were. Nothing else but perfection would be, would, be, would be enough. And so we have this truth here that God alone is always loving. Um, angels and, and uh, the spirits are unlike God, and we as mankind really are unlike God. But as you stop to consider it, who's greater? God, the angels, or mankind? Who's greater? God is, isn't he? He alone was there able to teach us about everything. He alone exists in the beginning, eternal, greater than all. He alone is all-powerful, existing by his own power. He alone is spirit, ever-present, all-seeing all the time. He alone is one yet trinity. He alone is all-knowing, nothing is ever hidden from him. He alone is absolute and final ruler over all his creator. He alone is absolutely holy, always acting perfectly. He alone is orderly, purposeful, and faithful in all he does. He alone is always, always loving. And that's what who God is. So let's proceed today's lesson to look at the creation of mankind. And we're going to look at it through these three themes. So God created us in his own image and likeness with a mind, emotions, and a will. Only God is the source of life and the absolute owner of it. God created just the first man, which means that Adam is the ancestor of all mankind. So this first one, God created us in his own image and likeness with a mind, emotions, and a will. So take your Bibles and turn over with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So as we look at this, as we look at this particular verse, I have it up here on the board, the first part of it. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So who is God talking to? Let us make man in, uh, um, let us make man in our, in our in image. Who's God speaking to? Who's he, discuss, who's he discussing the creation of mankind with? The Trinity. God the Father. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So why is it important to notice that God wasn't, wasn't having a conference with the angels on the creation of mankind? Why is it important to note that he's not discussing this with Lucifer? Yeah, we're made in whose image? In God's image. We're not made in the creation of the angels after their image and likeness. We're created in the image and the likeness of God, who alone had the power and the knowledge to be able to do this. A, a small point, but it's a huge point. Only God did, doesn't he? Only he has the ability to be able to do that. Um, there's none equal with God that he can discuss anything with. So then how did God make us? In his image, right? As a reflection, as a reflection of him. When God made us in his image, he wasn't speaking about our bodies because God doesn't have a body. As we learned earlier, God is, a, God is a spirit. So he's speaking about the real us. He's speaking about our soul and our spirit, um, the, re, the real us. So stop and think about this. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit together planned our creation. Isn't that amazing? We didn't just come about. They planned our create, they planned, they planned our creation. The Trinity planned that we would be a reflection of Him, just as we see my reflection in, my, in the characteristics in my children. So God too created us to as a reflection of who He is. So did God create the angels and the animals in His image as well? No, He didn't, did He? So does the Bible speak of the Trinity having a discussion at any other part of creation? So they got together. Okay, so it's time to create the, the vegetation. So does God's word in Genesis chapter 1? Speak about the Trinity getting together and, okay, how are we going to do this, guys? No, it's only for, it's only for, our, it's only for our creation because um, mankind is special to the heart of God. They're, we're that special to understand. We need to understand that. So why would God only create mankind in his image? Why is it important to know that God only created us as mankind in his image? It sets us apart from the rest of creation. Absolutely. What else? He wants a relationship with us at a, at a level not with the angels and not with the, with the animals. Absolutely. What else? Are we not that special to the heart of God? Absolutely. He wants to demonstrate our value to him. He wants to demonstrate this purpose in, in all of that. We have a position far superior to the angels and, and to the animals. There's also another side to God creating in his image, and it was already talked about that, a purpose for an intimate relationship with us. Think about that. He only gave mankind the ability to have a personal relationship with him. He didn't do it for the animals or for the angels. Mankind was elevated to that particular role. This is absolutely huge when we stop to consider the, the ramifications. So when God created us in his image, he was speaking about three abilities that, he would, that would enable us to engage with him in a loving, personal relationship. Those abilities are, as I've got rid of, a mind, emotions, and a will. So we are able to think and reason in a way that is superior to the animals and the angels. We are able to feel more emotions than the animals or the angels. And again, I don't know how that all breaks down. I just know that we as mankind, we're created in the image of God, superior to the angels and the animals in, in, in regards to emotions. And then thirdly, we have a will to make a decisions in a way that's not available to the animals or to the spirits. So notice, we are unlike animals. We are unlike the spirits. And this is what separates us from the animal kingdom. This is what separates us from the spirit world. Let's pause to see what each of these abilities mean and unpack them as to, as to their importance as, as being created in the image of God. So very first, the first way that we are created in God's image is that we can think and reason as God does. Okay, so let's think about this. How does God, how does God think and reason? He created things in a certain order, like he said, water, then dry land, then vegetation, then animals, so... So you didn't have the animals for the vegetation. Yeah. So that order, that purpose, that thinking, that thinking it all through. Um, how about understanding the impact of each decision that he was making, and how everything would look, how everything would feel. Think of that two hundred thousand species of flower, or think of all of the different animals. How they all had to fit together and live in this ecosystem to function together. Everything fitting together. Like think of the sheer knowledge and the and the reasoning ability on God. And in this way, God created mankind in his image by giving us the ability to also think and reason. And so think about that for a second. So God's desire is for a relationship with us. If we couldn't think and reason as he does, what kind of relationship would we have with God? 
We have robots? Or as an animal, right? There would be kind of some simple response, but God didn't. He elevated us to be able to think and reason in order to engage with him, to, because that's his heart. That's his desire of blessing so that we can fully engage with him, so that we can enjoy the relationship, understanding and processing and responding and comprehending just who he is and all of his majesty and his glory, all that he's poured in. So that's how much he desires that relationship. And we can begin to understand it. We can begin to process it and appreciate it. So here's a question. Can a dog go to school to to learn to read and write? Absolutely not. When was the last time you've had an intellectual conversation with a dog? Why not? Because they were not what? They weren't created in the, the the image, image and likeness of God. God didn't do that, nor the rest of creation. So think about that. Mankind was created unique from all of creation so that we could think and reason and and engage with him through his written word, through his spirit, and through creation. We can deduct and we can respond to that. So here I have a statement here. I want you to read this with me. God created me in his image with the ability to think and reason. He didn't do this for any other creation. Truly, he desires an intimate relationship with me. Isn't that incredible? The second way that we are created in God's image is that we can feel like God does. So again, through the creation week, how have we seen God's emotions at play through the creation week? How have we seen God's emotions through creation week? As we go through scripture, we'll see that he gets angry, he's heartbroken, he's happy. So think of us being created in the image of God to feel as he does in this way. We are completely different from all of the animal kingdom. We can sense God's love for us and we're able to love him in return. We were not created as robots or as animals with simple emotional responses. Now think about this. Could God not have made us as simple emotional responses like a dog? But he didn't do that, did he? He created us as greater. He created us to engage with him, to sense his love for us, to be able to respond to him in kind. He was purposeful in doing that. It It flows out of his heart. Like how amazing is that? To stop and to consider a God who would create us in that particular way. So here's another, here's another statement I want you to read with me. So let's read it together. God created me in his image with the ability to feel his love and to love him in return. He didn't do this for any other creation. Truly, he desires to have a relationship with, with me. Stop and consider it. So the third way that God created us in his image was to give us a will that enables us to make decisions. So again, how has God already demonstrated that he has a will through creation? Willed everything into existence. Absolutely. He made what? He made the decision, didn't he? And then he followed, he followed through. He followed through with that decision all the way through. So think about us being created in the image of God uh, with a will from another angle. If we consider a tree, can it decide what happens to it? No, absolutely not. But God, what did God do for us? God created us in a way that we have the ability to respond. We have the ability with a will in order to engage and respond accordingly. Like how incredible that God didn't make us as dumb as a tree. He made us with the ability to choose. Like, like this is a simple point, but it's huge. He gave us a will more like his own to make decisions. As a result, we can, we, we can respond to his word. We can respond to what he teaches. We can respond to his, his declarations to us. And again, it's just absolutely incredible. So here's one more statement. Let's read it. The wording's maybe a little bit small, but read it with me if you can. God created me in his image with a will and the ability to make decisions like himself. He didn't do this for any other creation Truly, he desires a relationship with with me, absolutely, and to stop and to consider how how credible that is. So here's a question. Is it true that the one who spoke everything into existence desires to have a personal relationship with me? The one who spoke everything into existence, the one who's all-powerful, all-knowing, absolute desires to have a relationship with you and with you and with each of us? Like, isn't that, like, like, just pause on that for a second. Pause, camp out on that for a second. That God would care enough about each of us that he would instill that ability to know him, sense his love, and to be able to respond to him. So here's a question. How can we know, how can we know that he desires that personal relationship with us? How can we possibly know that he wants that relationship with me. Like little old me, look at all the junk that I've done. Look at, like no way, God could never want a relationship with me like the likes of me. How can I know, based on what we've just learned, that God wants that relationship with, with the likes of me? 
What proof have we just looked at that demonstrates to us in the thick of it, when, I'm the, when I feel my worst, that God wants that relationship with me? He made us in his image with the ability. So if I can think, what does that declare? God wants a relationship with me. If I can feel whatever that is, that's a declaration from God himself that he loves me and he wants that relationship with me. And because I have that ability to respond, again, as another declaration from God himself, the one who created, desires that relationship with me. But he's also sent us his word. He didn't send it to the animals. He didn't send it to the spirits. Who did he send it to? To us. And what does this declare? His love for us, his desire of relationship, because this is his love letter. This is him revealing himself, to the vulnerability of himself, to, to reveal himself to us as mankind so that we would know him and we would choose to enter into a relationship with him. And so all, this, all of this proves that God desires to have a personal relationship with us. What comes to mind as you, th- as you stop and think about that? That God, the one who is this absolute, and we are this small, desires that relationship with us. Think about this. God knows, God knows everything about each and every one of us. And yet he still desires that relationship with us, regardless. So I don't know how much you'll be able to see here, but I have a picture of different peoples around the world. And, um, and so hold it up here. And so as we look at all of these different people, how do we know that these people were created in God's image? How do we know that every one of these people, as funny as maybe they look, how do we know that every last one of them was created in God's image? Sorry? He said so? Absolutely. How else? They can think, feel, and choose. Absolutely. He instilled that ability in every last one of them to think, feel, and choose. They're all, in that regard, created in the image of God. And you can just put it down on the floor there. Absolutely. And God also desires to send his word to every last one of them because he desires to engage in that relationship with, with them as, as they go along. They were created in his image. So let's illustrate our response to God in another way. What do parents desire from their children in a response to love that they give to them? What response do parents desire from their kids in response to their love? To love them, absolutely. And what else? Obedience? Yes? How about respect? And do you think God desires the same thing? Do you think God desires that we would respond to him with love and respect as well? That we would choose to run into his embrace? God didn't make us as robots where he forces us to love him. He gives us that choice to freely give him our love. And that's built into us at his creation. We'll talk more about that in the next lesson. So let's consider another response to our God. Who do people typically worship and seek help from today? So counselors, absolutely. Doctors, yeah. How about, how about religion? Tradition? Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's, let's consider, let's evaluate each of these as to whether they can help us and respond to, our, respond to the help that we seek from them. So which of these can truly think, reason, and uh, make decisions? Can any of these? Are any of these equal? And I'll just put God over here. Is any of them equal to God? Absolutely not. They all all come short. We were created in the image of God much as my son reflects me as his father. We We weren't created in the image of traditions. We weren't created in the image of counselors or Oprah. We were created in the image of God himself. So why do we seek help from those who are lesser of lesser value? Why do we seek help um, from those things that were created, such as people and, and those things? Why do, we, why do we worship and seek help from things that are so in, insignificant and so inferior in so many ways? God alone stands absolute. We were created in his image. We were created in that image to seek him and to seek help from him alone. So truly, God has created us in his image for the purpose of a relationship. So can you, think any, can you think of anything in our society that is contrary to this truth? I'm too bad. Animals are equal to us. There was a, there was a legislator in, in the United States that wanted to pass legislation that trees could be able to take us to court. So okay, let's, okay, so let's stop and think about it. I'm too bad. How does, that, how, does that, how does that strike at God creating us in his image? How does that clash or contrary to, to who God is in creating us in his image? So it limits his love? Absolutely. God doesn't make anything imperfect. Did God put conditions on the relationship and in coming into it and creating us in his image? 
No, he gave us every, equally the ability to think, feel, and reason for that relationship, didn't he? Now, some of it will go on as we go along through with it, but at this point in creation, we were created for that, everybody was created for that intimate relationship. And so then animals are equal to us. How does that speak, or how does that clash with the truth of God's word? Let us make man in our image. They weren't created in his image. They don't have a mind, emotion, and a will as created by God. And so what do we need to do with this? We need to trash it because it clashes and it dishonors who? It dishonors the one who created, the one who's declared in his word that mankind was created for that relationship. So God created us in his own image and likeness with a mind, emotions, and a will. Number two, only God is a source of life and the absolute owner of it. So t- let's read Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So on the sixth day, God created just the first man, right? Created male and female. So which of them was created in the image of God, man or woman? Both of them equally? Both of them created absolutely for a relationship with God? One has lesser ability to think and and feel and, and, and make decisions, right? Not according to God. They were created. And so God called the first man Adam and the first woman Eve. Both of them were created on the sixth day. So what we're going to do in this lesson, we'll look at the creation of man and in a future lesson, we'll look at the creation of Eve, both happening on the sixth day. So let's go over to Genesis chapter 2. God offers an expanded view of Adam's creation on the sixth day um, in chapter 2. And let's read verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Okay, so how is, man, how is Adam's creation different from the rest of creation? He was made from dirt, absolutely. He breathed life into them. So what was Adam like after being formed but not having the breath of life? He would have been like an animal. Actually, no, he wouldn't have he been even less than that because there was no life in him. He was just a corpse, wasn't he? So at what point exactly was Adam created in the image and likeness of God? When he was formed of the dirt? When God did what? God breathed life into him, breathed his soul and his spirit into him. At that moment, Adam awoke in the image of God, looking into the face of the one who created him, with the ability to think, reason, and make decisions. I wonder what went through Adam's mind as consciousness came into his mind for the very first time. Who do you think spoke first? The Bible doesn't say, but, but this is a real person. with real. This is a real situation. This isn't just a make-believe story. At one point, Adam was a corpse, and the next, he's a living soul with the ability to think, feel, and reason, and, and, the, and the creator breathed life into him. What would, that, what would that have been like? No idea, absolutely, but just it's, it's good to, to think on that. Let's read uh, verse 7 again to see God as the giver, the giver of life. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So here's a question. Was Adam able to give himself life? No, because what was he prior to this? He was lifeless. He was lifeless dirt. An angel of spirit must have been able to give him life to Adam, right? No, why not? Why couldn't the, anim- why couldn't the spirits give him life? Why couldn't the angels give Adam life? They can't create anything? Absolutely, what else? They, have no, they don't have the power. Whose image did God create us in? His own, not in the image of the spirits. The spirits weren't created in the image of God. We stand separate and, uh, to that. Let me try to illustrate how God is the sole source of life. So if I was to take, Darwin, you can come up here a second. If I was to take this 50 bucks here, and I was to give this $50 to Darwin, okay, who does, this, who does that $50 belong to now? It belongs to Darwin. He can do with it as he pleases, Right? Yeah, you take it and run. You can sit down. Thank you. So, so here's a question. Did God give life to Adam in the same way that I gave the $50 to Darwin? That now Adam can do with that life as he pleases? It's now completely Adam's. Just like the $50 now belongs to Darwin, he can do whatever he pleases with it. So too, yeah, he gives it to his, his fiance. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so is, that, is the same way, did God give life to Adam in that same way? Okay, Adam, here's your life. Take and run with it. It now belongs to you. Hands off. It's whatever you want to do with it. So Adam had a free will. So in that regard, there was some freedom. But who was he dependent upon? God was, because moment by moment, what did Adam need from God? Everything to live, the next, the next breath to be even breathed. Adam was dependent on God. So how should Adam have treated this gift of life from God? How should Adam have treated that gift? It's precious. Given to him from the very 
creator who breathed life into him. There's, there's a special connection between that, almost like a mother and a child, but even more so than that, I think. I'm not a mother, but to appreciate that. God instilled life into Adam, creating him in his image with a will to choose, yet Adam was always dependent on God, his very life moment by moment. And as such, his life belonged to God. These aren't my words, but rather God's. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, it states that all things were created through him and for him. In fact, it says that he holds all things together in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. This is huge meaning for us as created. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalms 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Okay, so based on this verse, according to God, who does Adam belong to? To God. How much? What percentage? All of it. 100, 100%. So this is absolutely profound, and I'm going to write it up here. Adam exists for God. God does not exist for Adam. And Adam is accountable to him. Adam was not, was not created as independent. Yes, he was given a free will, but his very life was bound and was tied to the one who created him moment by moment. True freedom for Adam would only come through his continual acknowledgement that he existed for God. True freedom would only come through that. So let's pause, let's pause to illustrate this truth. God is the sole owner and source of life and the absolute owner. Let's, let's illustrate that. So here's what I want you to do. Everybody take a deep breath. Take a deep breath and hold it. Okay, now breathe. Where did that breath come from? From God. Okay, hold your breath one more time. Hold it, hold it. Now breathe. Where did that one come from? Do we realize that we're only one breath away from death at any point in time? If God did not give us that next gift, that next breath of life, because what store can I go and buy a cup of life breath? Where can I go and get some more? If God, the giver of life, doesn't give me that next one, what happens to us, as I said? Yeah, we're going to be dying. Have you ever stopped to think about it in this way? Moment by moment, the giver of life gives us another breath. Gives us another breath. What comes to mind as we, as we think of this, of this truth that God is the giver of life and the owner of it, as we understand the next breath that I need comes from, personally, from the owner and the giver of life? What comes to mind? Yeah, absolutely. God's the giver, and we have a free will in that to choose. There's, that gift has no strings attached to it. Like it is, there's, we're accountable to him, but, but there's, a, there's a will and there's a freedom to decide as to how we're going to use that breath. We exist for God and are accountable to him. This means that we're also going to need to apply this truth that God is the only source of life and the owner of it. So as we consider that, what beliefs, what beliefs again clash with this truth that only God is a source of life and the absolute owner of it? What beliefs, what things in our culture or thinking clash with this? Evolution, reincarnation, abortion. Absolutely, life is, life, abortion is cheap. It strikes a very, the giver of that source of life. I have control. I'm the owner. I can determine what happens to that life. I didn't give it, but somehow I take God's place to take that. Absolutely. And so there's a, there's a number of other things. And so, again, what do we need to do with these? Destroy them because they dishonor God as the source of life and the absolute owner of it. And so we need to destroy it because we need to have this magnificent view of who God is in all of his majesty, in all of his glory. Let's praise God that he is the source and owner of life. Number three, just quickly, it's a short point here. God created just the first man, which means that Adam is the ancestor of all mankind. So uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28 says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then chapter 3, verse 20 as well. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all, all living. So who is the ancestor of the entire human race? Adam and Eve. 
Adam and Eve here were based on the creation. As you go later in Scripture, it says that God rested on the seventh day, that his creation was complete. There was no more creation that took place after the sixth day. Everything was complete, and God rested from his work. Nothing was added. He didn't create any more people thereafter. Every last man, woman, and child has their, has their ascends from Adam and Eve. So stop and think about this truth from God's word in creating just one ancestor for all of mankind. Did God create a white man and then a black man? No, he created how many? Just one, didn't he? So why can we say that? Well, how do we rest on saying just one man? What are we resting on to make that statement? His word, absolutely. And this word is and the eyewitness account of the one who was there who breathed life into that very first man. And so that's what we rest on. Notice how God doesn't describe the color of Adam's skin. But from Adam, from that one, come all of the varieties on the different colors of, of skin around the world, all descended from Adam. We've got to bring God's word into our culture. We've got to bring God's word into our thinking. God's word is absolute. What I think, feel, and believe is secondary. This is absolute. So as we bring God's word, that all have one common ancestor in Adam, as I bring that into my culture, my thinking, what has to go? What has to be discarded? Racism. Yeah, absolutely. Whites are more evolved, are better. They can think more clearly or whatever, whatever those are. There's also a belief out there that this book is the white man's Bible. And so what's, what strikes that? Can we think of any others that, that strike at this, at this point? And whether we believe it or not, whether we like it or not, every one of us have things in our lives and in our thinking that strike at the very heart of God that we have a common ancestor and if we're truthful and bring God's word in, there's things that are going to have to be discarded in order to have a high view of who God is as the one who's creator and, and master of all. So again, we're going to do this. What's are these beliefs? We're going to trash it. Because they do what? I don't like it. Why are we trashing this? Because they, they dishonor God and they dishonor his word. And we need to, we need to, we need to destroy it. Because God is absolute. God created Adam as a sole ancestor. In conclusion, isn't it amazing that the one who spoke the worlds into being, God has created us in his image for a personal relationship? Think of God in all of his majesty and all of his glory. Desires a relationship with me and with you. He didn't do that for any other part of his creation. Think of the impact of this and in how God views us. When my son who represents me performs well, whether it's in sports or in the arts, I pull my friends over and say, there's my son. Do you think God doesn't, God doesn't uh, our, um, God's, uh, it, our acceptance with God or his love isn't based on performance, but do you think God pulls the angels aside and says, there's my creation? Do you think he takes pleasure in us who are created in his image? Isn't that incredible? Just as we do with our kids, so too the, the one who created us. But think of it from another perspective. Prime Minister Trudeau doesn't even know we exist here in Ozo, does he? But the one who created the worlds knows we exist. He loves us. He desires that relationship with us. He's instilled within us the ability to know him. The truth of God's word uh, in our being created in his image for the purpose of personal relationship with God takes incredible pleasure in. God takes incredible pleasure in a relationship with us.